And what I'm going to be talking about today is weaving some of those strands together, the relationship between pollination services, between bumblebees and their parasites, and what that means for both wild and potentially commercial pollination services. And just to set the scene, um, pollination, as you all know, is incredibly important um, for food security. It's also obviously incredibly important for natural ecosystems. Without pollination, we wouldn't have flower-rich meadows because the flowers wouldn't get pollinated. It's been increasingly obvious that we need to put numbers on this service for people, particularly economists and politicians, to understand the value of pollination and therefore to maximize efforts to maintain a sustainable pollination service. And so the most recent figures suggest that within the European Union, purely for commercial crop pollination, which is, as we saw in the picture before, um, many soft fruits, um, apples, pears, and also, interesting, um, and also um, things like oilseed rape, where pollination is required for maximal crops. We have a value across the EU of somewhere around uh, 100 and, any second now, 53 billion euro. And we can narrow that down a little further. We can be a little bit more parochial about it, and we can look simply at the UK. And when we do that, the most recent figures from a, a review by Tom Brees and colleagues from the University of Reading suggest that in the UK, commercial crop pollination adds about 430 million pounds of value to crop production. And it affects 20% of the area of the UK that is used for crops and 28% of the crop sales. So pollination is obviously extremely important. And in a world where food sustainability is one of the key questions, where populations are growing and where pressure on agricultural services is becoming higher, pollination is only going to become more important. Who is doing it? <coughs> this is a really hard question to answer because there aren't particularly brilliant data for the vast majority of crops. And that's even before we look at natural ecosystems and natural populations of flowering plants where the data are even fewer. However, if we wanted to do a broad swathe answer in the UK and most of the EU, certainly, we would say that pollinators probably belong to the groups that I'm showing here. So the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, which you had a talk about from Francis Ratniex last week. The species within the genus Bombus within the UK, we've got roughly 25. Within Europe, we've got about somewhere between 50 and 75, depending upon where you draw the boundary and where you stop counting. <coughs> A lot of people think butterflies are, are pollinators, and yeah, probably not, um, but they're very pretty, so we like to include them. Hoverflies are probably very important pollinators, but we know very little about them, apart from a very small number of crops or wildflowers. And solitary bees here, this is Megachylae, a leafcutter bee, are also probably important, but again, we have very few data indicating how important they actually are. The fact that we know that these three groups are quite important is demonstrated by the fact that honeybees are essentially a managed pollinator. There are no or almost no wild populations left in Europe due to the destruction wreaked by the emergence of the Varroa destructor mite, which carries viruses which ultimately kill honeybee colonies unless they're managed by beekeepers. Bumblebees, which have become a commercial industry as well as um, a very important managed wild pollinator. And solitary bees, which whilst in Europe there isn't an awful lot of commercial solitary bee pollination, although it is starting, in North America the alfalfa leafcutter bee is one of the most important um, commercialized pollinators out there. But as I said, we don't have an awful lot of data. For a very small number of crops, we can say, or, or flower species, we can say, yes, this pollinator is important, this one isn't. Bluebells, for example, are pollinated by a species of bumblebee, Bombus pascorum. But generally, it's very hard to say anything. And so it was quite interesting when a couple of weeks back, a paper came out in Science by Gar Garibaldi et al., which I really recommend reading, who tried to ascertain at a global scale which pollinators are more or less important. And I'm not going to talk about their study in detail. I'm just going to show a single slide from it. Um, and this rather complicated graph has a very simple message. So what we've got on the bottom are honeybees, wild insects, 
which essentially means wild bees, and something which they've called interaction here. And I'm not going to look at this column. We're just going to look at these two. And what these are are average regression coefficients across crops across the globe. And what we can see is that honeybees are very important for moving pollen around. They're very important at picking up pollen from one flower and depositing it on another. But they're really quite rubbish at actually pollinating things. So honeybees are out there. They're very abundant. They're flying around. You see them on flowers. But actually, in terms of pollination service, what these data suggest is that for crops across the globe, averaged across all crop species, honeybees are not particularly useful. In contrast to that, we can see that wild insects, and this is largely wild bees, are less good at moving pollen around, but when they do, they're much better at increasing pollination of crops. So what these data tell us is that wild bees and bees other than honeybees are probably very important, certainly as wild pollinators, and quite possibly, particularly in North America with the alfalfa leaf cutting bee, and globally with commercial bumblebees as commercial pollinators too. As I said, this wild insects really narrows down probably to wild bees, because bees are, out of all the insects, the most important flower visitors in terms of abundance and in terms of species richness, with somewhere around 20,000 species of bee worldwide. But certainly in temperate areas, and certainly in areas like Europe, or certainly Central and Northern Europe, and particularly in the UK and Ireland, bumblebees are probably the most important wild bee pollinators. And I'm sticking my neck out a little bit here because we don't have good enough data to say this emphatically, but in terms of abundance when you go out and look at the number of animals on flowers, and in terms of when they forage, and in terms of their geographical range, bumblebees are just more there than solitary bees. They're arguably much more important, and this is one reason why they've been heavily commercialized. And so what we've got here is a commercial bumblebee nest container sitting inside a glass house which is growing tomatoes. Um, here's a little bee, um, bumblebee, pollinating a tomato flower. And they're very good at this because they do what is called buzz pollination. So when they get onto the flower, they grab hold of it, and then they disengage their wing muscles from their wings, and they vibrate their wing muscles, and that makes their body vibrate, and that makes the flower vibrate, which releases pollen. And that pollen can then be used by the bee, but also for pollination. And but commercial bumblebees as an industry really started in the early 1990s at a big scale. And if we look at the numbers nowadays, the two major European producers, who are the major global producers, produce somewhere in the range of over a million colonies a year, which are transported around the globe for pollination. And they're not just used for tomato pollination, they're also used in polytunnel crops, and they're increasingly being used in the UK outside of tomatoes for strawberries, other soft fruits, and also even in apple and pear orchards. And what we can see in these images around here, which I lifted from the um, BioBest website, which is one of the two major producers of bumblebees, are bumblebees on a whole bunch of different commercial crops. If we think about the numbers in the UK, currently our best data from last year suggests that UK um, crop growers are importing somewhere around 40,000 commercial bumblebee hives. And each of those hives is costing them about 40 quid. So we're talking about quite a substantial sum of money being invested by the agricultural industry in the UK to increase pollination services of their crops by these commercial bumblebees. What we don't have are particularly good data of whether they actually do a good job or not. What I want to really talk about today is how that pollination service by bumblebees could be impacted um, by one of the stresses which they face, and that stressor is parasites. And this is something that I've been interested in and working on since 1998. Um, and myself and a number of other groups um, in Europe and around the world have really focused on the impact and the evolution of parasites in bumblebees. And to understand that work and to understand where the important points are from a pollination perspective, we have to understand the bumblebee life cycle. And that's what this picture shows here. So in the winter, which we now have actually left, um, 
only bumblebee queens are alive. And I'll go over this swiftly because I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with it. If I go over it too swiftly and someone doesn't, isn't familiar with it, please stop me and I'll, I'll be more elaborate. So they hibernate, they largely hibernate underground in a variety of different places. And when it warms up in the spring, as it did intermittently over the last couple of months, but it really has done now, even if it doesn't feel like it, they come out of hibernation. And so all the large bees that you're seeing flying around at the moment are bumblebee queens. And what they're doing is coming out to get food. They're going to plants and getting nectar and pollen to revive themselves and to develop their, their ovaries, but they're also looking for somewhere to make a nest. And once they've found that site, and the site varies depending upon the species, they will then start collecting pollen to make a little ball into which they lay their eggs. And once they've done that, they spend the next 25 days or so brooding those eggs, generating heat with their body to keep those eggs and larvae warm as they develop to speed up their developmental process until about a month later, the first worker bumblebees, the daughters of the queen, emerge. And at that point on, the queen really doesn't do anything apart from bully her workers to do what she wants them to do and lay eggs. And that carries on, depending upon the species, from anywhere from a six weeks up to two, three, four, maybe even five months. And once the colony is large enough, if it gets that far, it then produces new queens and males. They leave the nest, they mate, the males will eventually die. They have a lifespan we've estimated recently, somewhere around 10 to 15 days in the field. Those new queens will find somewhere to hibernate and they'll go into hibernation in the middle to the, to, or towards the end of the summer. And the colonies that produce them will gradually die off, as will the old queen. And so a nice way to think about these is to think of them <coughs> of having the same life cycle essentially as an annual plant. They grow up from the seed or the hibernated queen throughout the year, they produce sexuals or seeds, and those then go back into the soil and then emerge again later. If we want to understand how this life cycle can be impacted in a way that will knock on, have knock on effects in ecosystem services like pollination, we need to understand the key points. And largely I would argue that those two key points occur during this foundation stage and during the growth stage. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, during the foundation stage, anything that impacts on a queen's survival or, or ability to produce colonies will, in the wild, lead to a reduction in the natural population of bees, which will therefore lead to a reduction in the natural pollination service they provide. And from a wild pollination perspective, um, this, is, this time in the life cycle is really important. From a wild and a commercial perspective, probably the next most important bit is anything that impacts on the growth of the colony. Because anything that makes the colony smaller means there are fewer workers, which again means there are fewer flower visitors and less pollination. And I'm going to be focusing really on the impacts of parasites at these two stages in the life cycle of the bees. And it's possible to, to do that with some degree of real knowledge in bumblebees because they have a lot of parasites and we know from work that's been done over the last 10, 15 years, an awful lot about them. So this is just really um, a set of pictures to demonstrate the diversity in the parasites. I won't be talking about all of these, although I'm happy to chat about them later. Um, I'll be focusing on just a few. Um, but just to give you an idea of this diversity, parasites can be microparasites. So here we've got a microsporidian parasite, Nizema bombi, which is a fungus, um, which is an endoparasite of bumblebees. This is a gut trypanosome parasite, Crotidia bombi. They can also be slightly larger, so these are nematode worms, which parasitize the queen bees, which I'll talk about in some detail in a bit. Um, this is a tracheal mite sitting inside the breathing tube of one of the bees, so this is the mite here. And what she's done is embed herself in the wall of the trachea, or the breathing tube of the bee, and she's sucking hemolymph out of the body of the bee. The bee's not really able to do an awful lot about it. Um, up to larger parasitoids. So this is a canopid fly, which will catch bees in flight, lay eggs into them, and those eggs will then develop into pupae, which have a whole suite of interesting effects on bees, which I, I won't talk about in my talk, but I'm happy to chat about later. And also parasitoid hymenoptera as well. So this is the 
result of a braconid wasp parasitism event on a bumblebee queen, and these are polyembryonic, so a single egg is laid, and that can then turn into anywhere up to 180, I think is my highest count, of larvae, which develop inside the abdomen of the bee, and then after about eight days, cause the bee to start digging in the ground, at which point they all emerge from her abdomen, burrow into the soil, and carry on their own life cycle, leading to her death. And this animal down here is suffering from deformed wings. And I'm throwing this in because we're increasingly understanding that a lot of viruses which have traditionally been thought of as honeybee viruses are in fact viruses of a broad array of pollinators. Um, and because diseases like deformed wing virus are very important in honeybees, <coughs> And because we now know from work that actually we're just finishing at the moment, that deformed wing viruses widely spread in bumblebees, understanding the impacts of these viruses and the transmission dynamics between managed honeybee pollinators and wild bumblebees is increasingly important. Now I said I've been interested in the ecology and evolution of parasites in bumblebees. And because of that, we don't just go out and look at a parasite species and try to understand it. We do it in a theoretical background. And that background really comes out of trying to understand the complexity of host parasites. when I was at Trinity College Dublin, and we used a very common bumblebee species, Bombus praetorum. This is known as the early bumblebee because it tends to come out quite early in the spring and has a relatively short life cycle, which makes it really nice for working in the lab because you can finish your experiments over about three or four months as opposed to the six or seven months that some other bumblebee species take. And what we did was to try to understand how the assemblage of parasites that attack queens of this species impact it and interact with each other. And to do that, we focused on these five species. So I've already introduced this trypanosome parasite, Crotidia bombi. This is the nematode again, Sphaerolaria bombi. This is that braconid wasp I told you about, um, the tracheal mite, and another actor, Apocystis bombi, which is a neo-gregarine microparasite, which is again an endoparasite um, in cells and in the gut and malpighian and fat systems of bumblebees. And this work, I should say, was largely done by my PhD student, Samina Rutrecht. And the first thing that Samina did was essentially to go out in the spring and collect about 160 Bombus praetorum queens, and then she reared those in the lab. And she kept those through their full life cycle, and when queens died, she then dissected them out to see what their parasite status was. And that enabled her to construct this community structure diagram for essentially that parasite assemblage across this single host species. And what she found was that it looked something like this. 
So a large number of bumblebee queens were uninfected by any of these parasites. <coughs> Some of them were infected by only a single parasite species, so six queens had Apicistus bombi only, for example. Um, 39 had Lucasticaris buchneri, the tracheal mite only. But a fair number of queens actually had multiple parasites, so had multiple parasite <coughs> species within them. So, for example, 10 queens had both the tracheal mite and the trypanosome. <coughs> Excuse me. And one poor animal. Um, really lucked out and had not just the, the trypanosome and the tracheal mite, but also the braconid wasp as well. And so once we know this assemblage, we can ask, what is the impact of these parasites on the bumblebees at a population level? In our population of bumblebee queens, what's happening as a result of this parasitism? And so we can look at that in two ways. We can look at it in mortality and we can look at it in longevity. and reproduction. And so what I'll show you in the first graph here are data for each of our parasite species lined up on the bottom. So our nematode, our wasp, our trypanosome, sorry I got that wrong way around, our, our neogregorine, our wasp, our <coughs> trypanosome, our nematode and our mite against the lifespan of queens in the lab. So this is not real longevity, this is number of days since bees were captured. But we think it's a good estimate of longevity because we were out there catching the bees as they emerged from hibernation. And what we can see is that two of those parasites have a huge impact on the likelihood of a queen actually surviving. So if you were infected by either the neogregorine or by this braconid wasp, within about six or eight days of capture, you died in the lab. And that means you're lost from the population, you're completely gone which means A, that as an individual you have no fitness, but B, it means our bumblebee population is decreased in the wild. The other three species um, of parasite, the trypanosome, the nematode, and the tracheal mite, seem to have no impact on the longevity of queens at all. But that doesn't mean that they're not having an impact at a population level. Because we can also look at the impact that they have on reproductive fitness of the bees. And we can measure this through castration. Essentially, were, was a queen able to develop eggs in the laboratory? And this is a, quite a conservative measure because in the lab, the queens have everything they need. We give them adlibitum pollen. We give them adlibitum sugar water. They don't have to fly around, so they're not trading off energy use, and they're not faced by any additional threats such as predators. And what we can see when we do that is that another of these parasites is having a dramatic impact. So this nematode worm is completely castrating queens within which it exists. And if we look at this together, what we can say is we're losing a whole suite of infected bumblebees, either through mortality at an early life stage before they could produce a colony, or through castration, which prevents them from using a colony. So it's all very well, these queens infected by the worm living for 70 days on average, but they're not actually producing a colony and therefore the contribution they're making to the bumblebee population is zero. We can go back to our community and see what the implications of that are, both for the bumblebee population and also for interactions among parasites. And what we can see is that firstly we lose all of these bees. So all of those infected by Apocystis bombi and all of those infected by Centritus splendidus, the braconid wasp. And secondly, we essentially lose all of these as well, the nematode infected queens that can't raise a colony. So the first thing that this shows us is that the population is losing, in this example, somewhere around 30 odd percent of all the queens that were present to parasites. And that is by any definition a high population impact. So parasites are acting in this sense essentially as a, a keystone predator, if you like. They're wiping out a huge swathe of the bumblebee population before it even gets going in the spring. The second in, important thing that it tells us is that from a parasite impact perspective, we need to distinguish between parasites that have an impact at this early stage and the parasites that remain in the population after that early stage. And from the perspective of parasite interactions, actually this simplifies hugely the problem that we have to understand because rather than having a five parasite community, what we're left with essentially in colonies of bumblebees is in this case only two different parasite species. And so if we want to understand their impacts 
on colony growth and colony behavior, then it's a much simpler question to address. And I'll go on to look at that a little later in the talk. So that study was looking at a single host species, Bombus praetorum, the early bumblebee, but you'll remember that earlier I said that it's not just parasites that exist in, in multi-species assemblages, it's hosts as well. And so I want to flip uh, our picture round to the other side and look at a study where we examined one of these parasites up close but across multiple host species. And that parasite is the nematode, which I've already told you a little, a bit, little bit about. I was a little disingenuous when I showed you that picture and said, here's the nematode, because actually, if we look at this picture in a bit more detail, you can see that there's a little, um, tiny little line coming off the, this nematode here. Yeah, everyone can see that? And I'm pointing it out in this one that's been melanized by the bee's immune system, because it's easier to see. But we could see a similar one coming off the, the white worm, which was not attacked by the bee. That is the worm. That's about two millimeters long. This is her uterus, which she's flipped inside out and then grown inside the bumblebee. And this can be anywhere up to two or three centimeters long. And just to give you a feeling for this, a bumblebee abdomen is about roughly two to three centimeters long. And a bumblebee queen can be infected. I think the highest count we've ever had is about 75 worms inside her. The highest count in the literature is somewhere around 120-ish. So these are actually really quite cool and amazing parasites. And they're particularly interesting because they have a very interesting life history. So this is the life cycle that I've already shown you of the bumblebees when they're uninfected. So a queen comes out of hibernation, makes a colony, produces sexuals and those new queens go back into hibernation. That's what happens when they're not infected by this worm. <coughs> if a queen is hibernating in soil where adult females of this worm are present, those worms will detect her, and we don't know how they do this, possibly through um, chemical messages or possibly simply because she's respirating and therefore the carbon dioxide concentration in the soil water around her will be a bit higher, we don't know. But anyway, they do find them, and then they, they drill inside the abdomen of the bee. And again, we don't know how they do that. They may go in through the mouth, they may go in through the anus, or they may actually drill directly through, in between the, the um, exoskeletal plates of the animal. They get into the abdomen, they flip their uterus inside out, and then they grow it a little bit. Not a lot, maybe about half a centimeter or so. And then they seem to stay in stasis for the next three, four, five months. When the queen emerges from hibernation, she starts out behaving like a normal queen. She goes to flowers and she collects nectar and pollen. But while she's doing that, the worm is growing inside her and about roughly seven days after emergence, the worm takes over. Any ovary development that the queen has disappears the worm seems to be absorbing all of the nutrients, and this is one reason for that enlarged, nutrient, uh, uh, enlarged uterus. It makes a large surface area for the absorption of nutrients from the host's blood. And at that point, the worm starts behaviorally manipulating this queen. And you can think of this as essentially the worm is inside a car and it's grabbed hold of the steering wheel. And what it does is it makes this queen not look for nest sites, but look for hibernation sites. So she'll fly around places that she would have looked at the autumn previously when she was looking to hibernate herself. And every time she finds one, she'll land and she'll dig a little bit. And when she digs a little bit, larvae of that nematode pour out of her anus and get into the soil. They then go through their last larval molt. The males and the females will mate. The males presumably then die off and the females will hang out in the soil for the next four or five months not feeding, just waiting until new queens come in to hibernation at that site and the worm's life cycle can begin again. So it's a really neat behaviorally manipulating parasite. But obviously it can also have a, have a potential impact, as we've seen already, on the likelihood of queens producing colonies because it castrates them, either through um, this passive nutritional absorption that's going on here or potentially through chemical manipulation. And we have some idea that that may happen through inhibition of part of the brain 
development in bumblebees when they come out of hibernation. But we don't have good, a good mechanism for that or really a good understanding of what's going on yet. And one of the problems we're working on is trying to address that at the moment. Now, in the literature, this parasite, this nematode, Sphalaria bombi, has been hoisted as a generalist parasite of bumblebees across all bumblebee species. But prior to the work that I'm going to show you now, we really didn't know whether that was true or not, whether one worm was infecting multiple host species, and if it was, whether it was having the same effect across all of them. And I just showed you some work in one species, Bombus praetorum. And what Mike Kelly, who was another PhD student of mine, did was to try to understand the impact and dynamics of this parasite across multiple bumblebee host species. And so he would go out in the spring, collect queens of many species of bumblebee, bring them back to the lab, um, examine them essentially for their ability to produce colonies, the presence of the parasite, the impact that it had, um, and then addressed a whole host of questions, um, some of which I'll tell you about today. And the first thing he did was to actually look at the abundance or the prevalence of this parasite across different host species. And so the data I'm going to show you are essentially estimates of the abundance of different host species against the prevalence of the parasite within them. And there are two reasons for doing this. One is that it's the first step towards understanding the impact of the parasite on bumblebee populations. And two, the distribution of parasite prevalence across host species can give us some idea of whether we're dealing with a generalist parasite or a specialist. And these are the data that Mike found. Each of these stars is an individual host species. And when you analyze these data, you find absolutely no trend. So it doesn't seem to matter how abundant or not abundant your host species is. It could be really rare, like this dot here. It could be really common, like this dot here. And this is Bombus terrestris, which is um, one of the most abundant bumblebees, not just in the UK, but across Europe. It doesn't seem to matter how abundant it is. Parasite prevalence varies across these species in a way that isn't predicted by host abundance. And that suggests very strongly that this is a generalist parasite. It suggests that the dynamics of the parasite are linked more to potential hibernation sites than to host species. The second thing that we can take from this is that whilst prevalence varies hugely, it can also be incredibly high. So our highest prevalence level was about 46%. So that's 46% of some species of bee when they come out of hibernation are infected by the nematode worm. In other species, it was zero. And on average, we're talking about somewhere around 30%. If the impact of this parasite is the same across all those species as it was in Bombus praetorum, that early bumblebee that I just showed you, that suggests a really high impact of this parasite in terms of controlling bumblebee populations in the wild. Firstly, just to really show that it was a generalist parasite, we did some transmission experiments. So Mike took mature worms from four different host species and then infected them against a common garden background, against Bombus terrestris. And what he found was that although there was some variation in their success, the, that variation was not statistically significant across host species. These stars don't show actual error bars. If they did, the error bars would be something like this. And that, again, suggests that those prevalence data really are evidence for a generalist parasite. When we look at the impact, however, things get a little bit more interesting. So what we've got across the bottom here is six species of fairly common bumblebees, Bombus hortorum, the long-tongued bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius, um, the, depending upon who you talk to, the red bottom bumblebee. Um, Leucorum, which is very similar to Bombus terrestris, Bombus pascorum, another long-tongued bee, and Bombus praetorum, the early bee that we looked at before. And all of these are both common and abundant across the UK and Ireland. This is a measure of ovary development, so a measure of their reproductive fitness in the lab when they're not infected. And so you can see that they basically all develop their ovaries in the lab when you give them adlibitum food. No huge surprise. When you look at the ones that are infected, the vast majority of them have that ovary development hugely impacted. And that suggests that in these five species, 
The picture that I showed you in Bombus Praetorum and the picture that people have talked about in the literature seems to be true. This worm is an active castrator of bumblebee queens. And if we combine that with those prevalence data, what we're saying again is that across multiple bumblebee species, certainly at the sites we looked at, around 30% of those populations are being wiped out at the beginning of the year. The queens aren't necessarily dying, but they simply can't reproduce. However, the picture's not quite that simple, because if we look at the left-hand species, Bombus hortorum, one of these long-tongued bumblebees, we see that there's no impact here on ovary development, whether the parasite is present or not. Now, unfortunately, this was a very, very low sample size because Bombus hortorum wasn't very common in the two years that we were looking for it. So it's hard to say anything definitive. But what it does suggest is that in this species, either the nematode can't develop or can't manipulate the host, or the host is resistant to it. So it may either be that the parasite is not adapted to that host species, quite why that would be when it seems to do perfectly well across this broad array of species here, all of which are phylogenetically quite distant to each other, or that this particular host species has evolved a mechanism of resistance. And again, quite why that would be, we don't know. As I said, those were small sample sizes. And what we've been doing more recently, since we've been based in the UK, is to look at Bombus hypnorum, the tree bumblebee. And this is a bee which has only recently arrived in the UK from Europe. It appeared, its first record was in 2001, I believe, in the New Forest. Since then, it's essentially spread across England and Wales, so you can find it all the way up to the Scottish borders, through East Anglia, through Wales, down into southwest, southwest England, Cornwall and Devon. And it's become very abundant. It's a very effective invader. And we don't really understand why, and one of the projects in my group, which is being led by Catherine Jones, is tr attempting to understand that. And out of that work, we looked at the parasite impact on these on this invading species. And what we found was that when they were infected by this nematode worm, 33% of queens were able to rear their colonies despite the presence of the worm. And this is based on a much larger sample size and gives us really definitive evidence that at least some species of bumblebee are capable of resisting this parasite. We don't know why, but it has obvious implications for the populations of those bees and therefore um, their value in the ecosystem. And how they resist is really an ongoing question for us, and it's something we're, we're currently doing studies to try and understand. I'd be happy to talk about that later. So those were impacts on queens at that early <coughs> stage in the life cycle, and they really have re relevance for understanding wild bee populations, and therefore potential um, pollination in wild ecosystems and also in crops that rely on wild pollinators. The second stage, that growth phase where we're dealing with the amount of workers being produced and how fit they are, relates much more strongly to potential impacts on commercial pollination, particularly from um, commercial bumblebees. And I'm going to really focus on two parasites here. I'm going to focus very largely on the trypanosome parasite, Crotidia bombi, and I'll talk a little bit about the microsporidium nazema bombi, although not in great depth. And the reason for doing that is really twofold. And the first reason for doing that is because these are the parasites that are really important in commercial bumblebees. So these are data that were published a couple of months ago by Tom Murray, who was a PhD student of mine. Um, and this is work that he did in his, in his first postdoc. And essentially what he did was to order in commercial bumblebee colonies, which are being marketed as disease-free and look to see whether that was actually true or not. And what he found was that when he brought those colonies in and looked at workers before opening those colonies up, so before they foraged in, in greenhouses or polytunnels, and therefore before they could pick up parasites from the wild, that their parasite status was not disease-free at all. What we can see here is a summary of these data. So here's Apocystis bombi, that neogregorine that killed those Bombus praetorum queens very quickly. The trypanosome, Crotidia, which is up here, the microsporidium, Nazema, there, and uninfected colonies. And what he found was that 20, roughly 26% of colonies were uninfected. They appeared to be relatively disease-free. However, coming up to 40% of colonies were affected by the microsporidium. 
roughly 25% of them um, were infected by the trypanosome, and then a small proportion of those were infected by the neogregarine. <coughs> and this is important for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's important because it tells us that these commercial bumblebees are bringing parasites with them. And that is important for two reasons. One is you're buying a product which is disease-free for your pollination. And in fact, what you're buying is a product that is not disease-free at all and that contains parasites that could well be impacting the efficiency of those colonies in pollination. The second reason it's important is because they're bringing parasites with them. And we know that commercial bumblebees forage outside of where they're supposed to forage. So if you stick a bumblebee colony into a greenhouse for tomatoes, about 60 to 80% of the pollen they bring back is not tomato pollen at all. It's pollen from outside the greenhouse. They go outside and they forage. And when they do that, they forage on flowers that wild bees are foraging on. And that's the perfect route for transmission for at least these two parasites here. And so there's the potential for pathogen spillover into wild populations. And this is something that's certainly currently being blamed, although with limited evidence, in North America for huge and rapid declines in four of what were previously their most abundant bumblebees. So it's really important for two reasons. And what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about the impacts of these, of these parasites and therefore the potential implications for pollination services. So I'll start with Crotidia bombi. This is the trypanosome parasite, and this is a really nice parasite to work with because it's very easy. So here are some transmission stages. You feed them to a bumblebee, put them in some sugar water, and it drinks them. It colonizes the gut, and three to four days later, you start seeing new cells of this parasite being defecated in the feces of the bee. So it has a very simple life cycle within a single animal, which means it's very easy to manipulate in the lab and do experiments with. All you have to do is collect poo from a bumblebee, which is very easy to do because they defecate as a defense response. So if you catch a bee, the likelihood is, is she'll shoot feces into your face. And they do this in the wild because their nests get attacked by small rodents, for example, and their first defense response, rather than going in there to sting, is to lie on their back and shoot feces to try and drive these animals away. So if you catch a bee and stick her in a vial, she'll defecate. You can suck up her feces um, using a, not a mouth pipette, I would like to add. Um, and then you can mix that with sugar water, and you've got your experimental inoculum. And so because it's relatively easy to manipulate, this is the first parasite I actually started working on in bumblebees. And the first thing to do was to see whether it actually had an impact at all. And prior to the work that I did, it was generally believed this was a relatively benign parasite and therefore not of particular importance from an impact perspective, although from an evolutionary ecology perspective, a great model system. And so what I did was to take bumblebee workers from a number of colonies to um, artificially infect them with this parasite, allow the parasite to develop to about seven days, which is the peak of infection, and then starve the bees and see how long it took them to die. Which sounds a bit horrible, but it's sort of a classic um, mortality experiment design. And what we found across the three colonies was that being infected increased the rate of mortality all bees died, so we're talking about the rate of mortality rather than additional mortality, increased that rate by 40%. So I'll just look at one of these graphs, but um, statistically they, they all essentially show the same thing. Our black dots are the infected bees, our white dots are the uninfected bees, and you can see that the infected bees are dying at a faster rate than the uninfected bees. This may seem like quite an artificial experiment, but actually, this mortality takes place over roughly a 12 to 24 hour window. And if you're a bumblebee, you don't have big nectar stores. You don't have a large array of honey pots like, like honeybees do. You keep enough, honey, uh, enough nectar in your nest for maybe one or two days of not foraging. And if you have a week of rain where you can't forage at all, which is something we had an awful lot of last summer, then that's sufficiently long for you to start feeling mortality stress due to a lack of food. And so if you're an infected bee under those natural conditions, you're going to die much more quickly, and that's going to have an impact on the survival of your colony and its growth rate. So to take that a little bit further, we then followed this up with a whole colony experiment, which is really the only way to understand the impact of parasites in social insects in general. And so 
to do that, what we did essentially was we mated hundreds of bumblebee queens in the lab, which you can do very easily by rearing colonies, taking the queens and the males out and sticking them into a flight cage. They'll happily mate. We could then take the queens out, infect half of them, not infect the other half, stick them into hibernation, which means putting them into matchboxes and dropping them into the fridge for about, um, in our case, two and a half or five months, depending upon the treatment. And then we could pull them out, put them into a climate room and rear colonies up from them and track their life history and therefore the impact of the parasite. That all sounds very easy. What it actually involves is about seven months of being in the lab, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, um, apart from that hibernation period when they're all asleep and you can get some sleep too. Um, but it was worth it because what we were able to show very clearly was that the parasite has a significant impact on colony growth. And so all of these graphs show the same structure. We've got bee queens that were kept in two and a half months hibernation, queens that were kept in five months hibernation, which is much closer to what they would hibernate for in the wild, and then the data combined across those two treatments. And I'm going to focus on the five-month data when I talk about this, but I'll preface that by saying that what we see when we do the statistical analysis of these data are overall effects, and I'm describing them using these because it's easier to see. So if we look at worker production, this is the size of colonies from zero workers to 150. Our white boxes are our control and infected queens, and our black boxes are our infected queens. And what we can see is under a realistic hibernation period of five months, the size of colonies that a queen produce, produces is roughly halved. And that obviously has implications for the value of colonies as as pollinators in a wild or a commercial setting. And if we just think back, roughly 25% of those commercial colonies are infected this, by this parasite. And so this is obviously going to be having an effect on their growth and therefore the number of workers that are flying out to pollinate. We see knock-on effects in the production of both males. So here we can see that in our five-month treatment, the number of males produced by a colony is approximately a quarter if it's infected than if it's uninfected. And overall, we see a decline of around a third. The number of new queens or gynes produced also declines hugely. And when we combine all of these factors to get a measure of fitness, so Darwinian fitness for the colony, its reproductive fitness, what we can see is that there's a decline um, which is really emphasized in that five-month treatment, but is true overall. And what we're seeing is a reduction in the queen's fitness by about 40%, which is huge. That's essentially the same thing at a population level of taking out 40% of queens. So if we think back to that earlier study with Bombus praetorum where we looked at multiple parasites, all of those queens that were surviving with the trypanosome would then be seeing a knock-on effect in their colony reproduction and their colony fitness. <laughs> so that's all within one host species in the lab. Can we say anything about what's going on in the field? Well, the problem is, is we can't do a proper field experiment with this parasite. And the reason for that is because it's incredibly easily transmitted. So these are data from another PhD student, student Mario Ruiz Gonzalez. And what he did was to try to understand the dynamics of this parasite across multiple host species in the wild. So he sat out in a meadow and constructed what we call a potential transmission network, which means he counted all of the flowers and he observed the bees foraging on different flower species. He recorded how frequently they went to different species and how frequently a flower that was visited by one bee was then visited by a second bee within the amount of time that transmission of this trypanosome parasite can occur. And he took all of these data, which were hundreds of hours of observation, and then boiled it down to this simple diagram. And what this rather, well, simple, what this rather complicated diagram shows is five host species, and it shows arrows which represent potential transmission. So, for example, if a Bombus lapidarius animal lands on a flower and is infected, it's highly likely that Bombus pascorum is going to pick it up. It has a big, thick arrow going from lapidarius to Bombus pascorum. Lapidarius is also likely to pick the parasite up from itself. It has a big big arrow going to itself. 
In contrast to that, Bombus muscorum is really quite unlikely to pick up the parasite from other species at all. It has only thin arrows going to it. And obviously the driver of these dynamics is how bees choose flowers to visit. And that is determined by a whole array of things. It's determined possibly by competition. It's determined by the tongue length of the bees and therefore the flowers that they forage most efficiently on. And it's also determined by the spatial temporal dynamics of the flowers that are out there as well. Mario then looked at the population genetics of the parasite and what he showed was that to some degree this transmission network can predict population structuring in the parasite. So essentially what this very simple diagram shows is that in these red boxes we have parasite populations that are distinct from each other. So Bombus pascorum parasites are distinct from Terrestris and Leucorum and Lapidarius are also distinct from those in Terrestris and Leucorum. And when you look at the probabilities of transmission in this web, those are fairly well predicted. However, it's not completely predicted. Another work Mario did suggested that differential immune response across host species and also um, temporal patterns in the abundance of host species may also be drivers of the transmission dynamics of the parasite. But again, these transmission dynamics are important for understanding this potential pathogen spillover that's happening. And I'm going to again show you data from Tom Murray because it's the most recent, although it's not the only study to demonstrate pathogen spillover. And what he showed is that, so what we've got here is distance from the greenhouse in kilometers, sorry, in, in um, log, log kilometers. Um, and what we've got here is the proportion of infected bees. And what we can see is that near to greenhouses, we're seeing a much higher prevalence of these parasites for Nazima Bombay here, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, and for Critidia Bombay here. So we're seeing significant declines as we go away. And what that strongly suggests is that these parasites are coming out of these infected hives and through those um, dynamic transmission networks with <coughs> Mario isolated here, we're getting spillover into natural populations. Finally, I want to talk about a slightly more complex impact that these parasites can have. And this is not work that's been done in my group, but it's work that we'd really like to follow up on. And so a group in Canada at the University of Toronto, um, led by um, James Thompson, were buying in commercial colonies for their experiments. And they found that these commercial colonies had the trypanosome parasite. No surprise given the results I already showed you. And they thought they would look at what the cognitive impact of those parasites were. Because we know that parasitism by these, um, by, the, by the trypanosome, impacts the immune system of the bees. And we know that there are links between immunity and neural ability in invertebrates. And what they did was essentially give these bees a foraging task. So they gave them an arena with flowers that were either rewarding or non-rewarding. And they tested how long it took infected bees and uninfected bees to learn that a flower was rewarding or not. So how efficiently are the bees foraging and how well are they focusing on particular rewards? And what they showed was that the uninfected bees um, which unfortunately they've shown in filled circles here, are much better at getting it right. They learn more quickly and they go to the rewarding flowers. In contrast to that, our infected bees infected by this trypanosome are just not as good. Their learning ability, their cognitive ability is reduced. So not only is this parasite impacting the life history of colonies, their growth and their reproductive fitness, but even colonies which have it, which grow, the workers in it are less good at foraging. They're less good at learning. And this has obvious implications for how they're going to forage in the wild, in natural ecosystems, but also on how they're going to forage in commercial systems, either as commercial bees or as wild bees that we encourage in the wild as pollinators. And so what I'd like to do is just wrap up with a few conclusions that I'd like you to go away with. Firstly is that parasites are really important if we want to understand bumblebee population dynamics and their role as ecosystem service providers. We've seen, and I hope you're convinced, that parasites can have a huge impact on the fecundity and the survival of bumblebee queens. 
knocking out anywhere around 30 or 40 percent of populations. And that has obviously obvious implications for bumblebee populations in the wild and therefore their role as pollinators. They also impact, as we saw with the trypanosome parasite Critidia bombi, colony growth. And again, that has implications for um, <coughs> potentially reduced pop pollination in the wild. And given what we know about parasites in these purportedly disease-free commercial bumblebees, which as I said, a million of which are being shipped around the world a year and 40,000 to the UK, I think has really interesting implications about the efficiency of their pollination and whether they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and which horticulturalists are paying lots of money for them to do. And finally, not work that we've done, but work that others have done, have shown that parasites impact cognition and foraging. And again, this can have potential impacts which are at the moment completely unexplored in commercial settings. And I would end simply by thanking all of my collaborators, Samina, who's now a professor at the University of the West Indies, very lucky person, Mario, who's now a postdoc in Spain, Mike, who's at the Vet Lab Authority, um, my postdoc supervisor, Paul Schmidt-Hempel, and regular Schmidt-Hempel, a researcher in that group, and Catherine Jones, a current PhD student at Royal Holloway, and all of the various bodies that have funded the work that I've talked to you about today. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. <laughs>